Welcome to Black Lodge Publishing's series of short introductory talks on esoteric and other occult subjects. This is the fourth and final talk on this subject and follows on directly from the first three parts where I introduced the listener to the magical world of atavisms. In this, the final talk, I want to draw together my analysis of what atavisms are, but more importantly, how atavisms might be magically activated by the practitioner. We can now begin to draw together the importance of our two key authors, and whereby those subconscious energies that Grant sometimes refers to as the forgotten ones, along with Spear's atavistic resurgence using sigil construction and their use, can lead to the activation of these subconscious atavisms and where they can flood one's dayside consciousness. The methodology is akin to that of my own research into the techniques used from pre-dynastic through dynastic in later Egypt in that of activating the Mehen serpent bark in order to travel the night side of the Duat at Keki, the Chamber of Darkness, and the Shetit, the Beyond, and wherein, although not identical to Grant and Spear's particular methodologies, the outcome is nonetheless somewhat similar, and wherein from those more ancient glyphs and associated iconography, we find outworked a similar magical methodology. These involve dislimming and activating those entities within our own personal Chamber of Darkness, and wherein we confront those atavisms by magically manipulating the glyphs and iconography, and these can then be used to aid in our magical understanding and explanation of being, cosmology, cosmogony, and therefore in our own personal engagement with the Aphidian current. As well as these techniques, some will be familiar with other methods of atavistic nostalgia, such as the assumption of God forms, this, for example, involves shifting one's consciousness into that of an animal by constructing and then activating the proper sigils. Thus, dream sequences can be created using sigils, including the desire to experience such as what Spare calls the karma of a cat or reptiles in dreams or indeed the consciousness of a bird of prey. For example, compare the Golden Dawn and Crowley's Assumption of Godhead, such as through that of a golden hawk or a jackal. For these reasons, Grant had rightly sought the origins of the Typhonian or Ophidian current in what was termed the Dark Dynasties of Egypt, and then from its historical spread from Egypt to the Near East and India, and then its return journey westwards. The current can then be activated and acts as an interstitial bridge between the initiate and the student, and this practice has remained central throughout occult history. So, for example, in Grant's development of atavistic magic, we discover at the heart of his novella, Snake Wand, a magisterial demonstration of both theoria et praxis, and where we read that, In order to regain God, the first idea and source of all, an infinite regression is required, a regression to the primal and possibly pre-protoplasmic state which would necessarily be free of the imperfections and limitations implied by individuality. We also see in Speer's methodology of sentient symbols and which concerned itself with prophecy and divination, hence in the calling out of energia and dunamis, Grant also informs us that sigils producing atavistic behaviour is similar in form to that of the Delphic Oracle involving the use of sigils and by intruding a sigil into the subconsciousness and where it is then able to think for us. And if the sigil resumes a query concerning some future event, will breed from its own sentiency the true child of its symbolic parts. Thus, if a glyph is correctly constructed so that no superfluous elements remain to breed useless ramifications, it will surely, as a geometrical symbol, give birth to its own truth or answer. In Grant's snake wand, he makes his narrator aware that practitioners knew instinctively that it was possible to return along devious lines of evolution to remote atavisms, and that a certain combination of vibrations could trigger a reversion to pre-human types of existence, 
that profound and terrible transformations of consciousness can be affected by the manipulation of little-known vibrations. All of this, which he had heard of in connection with the cults of voodoo and the obia. Yet, and as Crowley had tellingly or rather more poignantly noted that great artists are indeed superior to great magicians, and consider Crowley's oblique reference between a grimoire and a grammar and between casting spells and spelling, he even goes so far as to admit at one point that the greater part of magical activity lies in simply writing about it. Thus, we see in Grant's magic the activation of the current as that betwixt or between. And indeed, what better a place to actually dislim is in that where the portals open like interstitial gateways, a meant in Egypt, into that hypodoxy or sacred space of in-betweenness, and where access to the Ophidian current is further triggered through Heka magic, and where an Egyptian sir foresight can then be consciously recorded in corporeal form, e.g. ascribed or even performed. Grant's view of atavistic resurgence therefore provides us with somewhat of a double-edged magical philosophy. Firstly, in relating praxis to the engagement with clefothic entities, the husks of the nightside tree, or its hadath, the tree of knowledge. This method is taken by many a modern practitioner as a complete attunement to those dualistic and creative forces of darkness. However, and secondly, perhaps more importantly, we find that of a more mystical purpose and one which can only be described as that initiatory performance of the great work, exemplified through that of a non-dual monistic original pre-cosmic proto-existence, and thus in Grant's enduring interest in that of Advaita Vedanta. Yet, however, both of these views can also be equated with that of Simpson and the shattering of vessels described in later Kabbalah by the Ari, Isaac Luria, but whose roots can be found in those more ancient concepts associated with the original chaos of Nun, Atum and Apophis, that is, before Zep Tepi or First Time, e.g. that where linear time and cosmic corporeality find their genesis. So perhaps we have a good contender in the philosophy of atavistic resurgence to unify those seemingly bifurcated left-hand and right-hand paths. I leave this for you to decide. So one might ask, where does all of this take place? As Mick Staley points out in his Scintillations and Mauve, Grant's magical adventures in consciousness take place in the spaces between waking and sleep, between subjective and objective reality, in a space he calls the Mauve Zone. To make his unexpected connections, Grant relies as, as much on hidden Kabbalistic word-number correspondences and ritually induced visions as on scholarship, which he cites alongside lines from works of narrative fiction, including Algernon Blackwood, McCann and Lovecraft, and also Gerald Massey, and obviously Spare, Crowley, Fortune, and a plethora of other more modern magical authors and artists, including Nima and Michael Bertram. As Mick Staley reminds us that true creativity can occur only when these forces are invoked to flood with their light the magical network of the mind, the mind functions in something like three rooms of a house. One, subconsciousness, uh, likened to the dream state. Two, mundane consciousness, the waking state. Three, Transcendental consciousness, unfortunately veiled in the non-initiate by the state of sleep. These compartments are further conceived as being connected with the house that contains them by a series of conduits or tunnels. The house therefore represents trans-terrestrial consciousness. These invoked forces are then understood not as malignant or destructive entities, but as the dynamic energia of consciousness the function of which is to blast away the delusion of separate existence, the rooms mentioned in the example. Thus, in Snake One, page 25, Grant provides another stark warning relating to rhythmic vibration to that of dislimming. 
He states, the cacophony which destroyed the uncanny silence of the swamp unsealed within me latent cells of vitality. A savage exultancy swept through me, for I knew that the woman was becoming one of us, remembering again her primal form, assuming again the furry pelt, the cravings of the pit, atavisms dormant in all forms of matter until the bultu drums release them. I curse Troil and his insane meddling with the black arts. Grant's character in Snake Wand, on page 26, continues. I was confronted with a ferocious beast, snarling and rampant. Miraculously, there burned within it the essence of the woman that had been but a moment earlier. And in the truer hides and hidings of our far-flung ancestral atavisms, we came together. She reared up hindwards, and in the violence of our explosive impact, all human consciousness faded. The mind slipped, reeled, unhinged itself, as we participated once again in forgotten ecstasies. As in Hecate's fountain, the practitioner is prepared for ingress into those primal levels. Grant is correct that atavistic activation can be brought about by rhythmic vibration, sometimes associated with a slight skip or offbeat on the drums. For example, in Snake One, page 33, I heard in the offbeat frenzy of the drums the audible manifestation of that double current, the ultimate symbol of which was the bull too. The hyena, as totem, was symbolic of all half-lives, all twilight states, all cross-breeds and crossed roads, interweaving, seeping, coiling, worming its neither-neither sexuality into flesh, and stamping with the mark of the beast all those forms through which it satisfied its savage hungers. Wherever the bulltoo drums were heard, there upsurged the primordial atavisms. Wherever a soul was caught in the meshes of their rhythms, no matter how distant or near in time or in space, it was compelled to attend the Sabbath, where all its desires were fulfilled, and in return for which it was bound to infect by its crimes all other souls it encountered. As Kenneth Grant's exploration of the netherworld of consciousness continues in Nightside of Eden, and where the student is eager to experience the night side of the tree of life, and where to crawl into those interdimensional wormholes that undermine prosaic dayside reality. These are indeed the tunnels of Set. They are a network of dream cells in the subconscious mind, reached by projecting consciousness through Darth, the gateway of the manifestation of non-manifestation, Darth is the hidden sephira, throat chakra, and is connected to the lower throat, which is glyphed on the tree of life by Yesod. At the final ritual of Grant's snake wand, our main character makes an effort to aid his lover Gale, but he notes that the force of the current made any movement on his part was out of the question. The character notes, I had not Zyla, she's the novel's uh, femme fatale, cunning or her knowledge of these conditions, nor was I yet acclimatised to this lower and darker manifestation of consciousness, which resembled twilight as it facilitated between unremembered atavisms and human identities, recently lost or unknowable. In Grant's novella, The Darker Strain, these devious lines along which material causes travel are as intricate and as unfathomable as the weavers that adorned the walls of another of his femme fatale, Lorma's lair. Thus, beyond the mauve zone, from what depths of time such remote atavisms might resurge as causes of these causes, the human mind can know nothing. As you begin your occult journey with a small suitcase of personal belongings, you become absorbed in a web of lugubrious thoughts. You will most likely barely notice the journey. In Grant's The Darker Strain, the main character was living through a grimoire that had been left to him. He wonders with horror at the caverns of darkness that a causal seance had accidentally unsealed the atavisms and entities and where powerful emotional tensions combined with unusual atmospheric conditions had contributed to the degeneration of a human being and the production of a monster, a reversion to an earlier form of existence and the upsurge of dormant atavisms which had manifest eldritch entities from regions outside space and time. Therefore, 
Might not activating atavistic currents and magic be described as traffic between that which is and that which is not, i.e. between fact and fiction? If we are to speak of magic as art, should we not also speak of art as magic? That leads one through the mauve zone and beyond the circles of time to the ninth arch. The journey takes us through the bone-strewn caves that rest beneath the deepest cellars of the mansion of the human soul, the dark pits where all dreams and magics are spawned, all fictions and insanities born in the queer light of a buried moon, mauve-coloured, an interstitial region that leads to the night side, through the desert and to the tunnels of Set. In conclusion, my own magical experiments and experiences on this journey led me to reinvestigate those dark dynasties of pre- and dynastic Egypt and to which Grant points the way in developing one's creative esoteric praxis, exemplified as such in his Typhonian trilogies and in that of the Ophidian Current. Grant and the Hidden Law therefore sought to challenge the norm and whereby he expressed his view of fiction as a magical tool whereby the intrusive force might be human, cosmic or infernal, its method of manifestation is described in many cases with a clarity and detail which makes of the story a factual account which is accepted by the reader as veridical through the instrumentality of one's subconsciousness. To grant whether phenomenal or nominal projections, these were matters of illusion, a pseudo-problem, and this can be resolved by Advaita Vedanta as self-other ambiguity. Many thanks for listening, and for those interested in the earliest recorded evidence and root of the current, you might like to read my Flesh of Ra and the Chamber of Darkness, and please stay in touch for the next series of lectures. Many thanks. <laughs>